text one, I will. <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to ASF's monthly meeting. We're a nonprofit devoted to maintaining separation between religion and state, advocating a scientific and humanistic viewpoint, and improving the lives of nonbelievers. You can learn more about ASF uh, on our website, arfreethinkers.org, or by getting to know the members around you. Restrooms are in the back to my left, and uh, if you need them. And of course, uh, here's our standard disclaimer. ASF is a diverse organization with members who represent a wide range of opinions. The speakers who present at our big meetings do not necessarily represent the views of ASF or its individual members. Because we are a 501c3 organization, ASF cannot directly support candidates for public office, but we can advocate for causes such as separation of church and state, scientific literacy, societal progress, and truthful communications. Today's free thought of the day comes from the ancient Roman philosopher Seneca, and it may be worth keeping in mind uh, during this election year. The quote is, all cruelty springs from weakness. All cruelty springs from weakness. So, um, ASF helps free thinkers make friends and connections. If you haven't already said hello to the person next to you, if it's somebody you don't know, never met before in your life, Now's your chance. You have my permission to introduce yourself to them, make a new friend, and say hello, or just say hello to an old friend. We'll take a minute to <laughs> go around. That's enough of that friendliness. <laughs> Next up, we have. Um, Todd Billings with the skeptical sidebar, and uh, this is one of many uh, roles that you can take in these meetings if you'd like to volunteer. So would everyone please give a warm round of applause to Todd. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I uh, have ADHD and a little social anxiety, so if this comes off uh, in a, a bumbling fashion, I apologize in advance. Um, normally when we do skeptical sidebar, we pick a topic that a lot of people believe that we think is bunk, pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, etc., and debunk them. I'm kind of going the opposite direction. I'm, I, I chose to talk about a, a problem that sadly a lot of people in society deny or are skeptical of that I believe is very true and that is very um, long-lasting and continual devastating ramifications for a large segment of our society, and that is white supremacy and systemic racism. Because sadly, um, the vast majority, well, that's silver state, it depends on the poll, anywhere from half to three quarters of white America does not believe systemic racism exists. And what I am going to argue is that because of one thing, one pre uh, 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 premise that we all agree on, and one assumption we all agree on, that simply denying it proves it. Um, that premise would be that there are wide disparities between the black community and the white community in a lot of societal measures, economic, uh, employment, education quality, education access, healthcare, certainly the legal system top to bottom. And the reason that that premise proves that systemic racism exists by simply denying it comes twofold. One, the opposite of that is that um, white people obviously have disproportionate power in our society as, a, as a, the reverse correlate to them having a disadvantaged position. The other is you have to explain these disparities somehow. And of course, racists have always historically described it in racist ways. They have their negative stereotypes. Well, they're not as uh, hardworking, they're not as intelligent, they're not as trustworthy, they're more criminally inclined, they're more, they're more um, violent prone, they're less able to control their emotions, all these negative stereotypes. Well, the reason I say that you can prove systemic racism by the simple denial of it is, is that when you deny systemic racism, you are necessarily saying that you believe to some degree those other negatives. Because there are only two, there are only two options. Either there are socio-political factors that inhibit and impair the black community in ways that keep them disadvantaged, or the negative stereotypes are true. So you can't have your cake and eat it too. If you deny systemic racism, you're saying you necessarily accept these other things to some degree or another. You might say there's a mix even too, but I would argue that that 
A, still acknowledges systemic racism, and is B, still being racist, because until we eliminate systemic racism, if you have some suspicion that there is some element of these inferior com uh, traits, then you're just being a racist without basis. Because if you acknowledge the systemic racism, we gotta get rid of it before you can say there's a mixture. But I digress. So basically, if someone says, you know, systemic racism doesn't exist, they're necessarily implying they accept these negative stereotypes, and obviously that's gonna have systemic effects. Because since white people hold disproportionate power, if you believe these negative stereotypes and you're a renter, I mean, you're a landlord, aren't you going to try to find ways to not rent to someone you think is untrustworthy, someone you think is criminally inclined? If you're a, a, an employer, are you not going to find ways to try not to hire them? And if you're a, a policeman, are you not going to look at them with greater suspicion, going to uh, confront them more, uh, be on guard more? be on alert for danger more? Of course you will. It's a no-brainer that these things will happen. And so simply denying systemic racism leads to acceptance of, of those negative traits, which means they'll be implemented. Because systems aren't some abstract things separate from individuals. They are individuals that are working in agreed institutions with rules. So the system is landlords, it's realtors, it's bankers, it's the judges, it's prosecutors. These are people. And if they have these negative stereotypes, obviously they're going to come out in negative ways. So in the end, for those of you that might have been skeptical yourself or that might find it taxing when you encounter others that are skeptical of it, because the reason I, 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 I present this more simplified logical argument is because oftentimes we get, when we try to debate this with other people, it comes down to, to the facts and the figures, and that can be overwhelming, especially if some internet yahoo and you're sitting over here spending 30 minutes of research to put all this out here and they're just deflecting left and right. But they really can't deflect around that. So anyway, um, I just wanted to come up there and uh, uh, put that idea out there to maybe uh, influence some that might be skeptical yourself because um, this problem is not going to go away without us fighting it. It's not going to go away on its own, and it's going to need a uh, first step being that white America accept that it is indeed a problem that we need to help fix. So anyway, that's all I got. Word, word to the wise, never go that way. <laughs> Next up. We have a member story by our very own Byron Bradley. Could we give him an equally warm round of applause? Thank you, sir. To follow up on what Todd said real quickly, I found it interesting when I learned that the United States Army Air Corps originally would not allow black men to be pilots because they just were not athletic enough. <laughs> As the NBA season gets underway, we should think about that. Uh, before I start my member story, some of you folks need to volunteer for some of these things. The, the, the easiest thing to do is the thought of the day. Uh, member story is pretty easy. You're relating something from your life. But the one that's really fun is a skeptical sidebar. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something in your life that is considered to be conventional wisdom that just pisses you off. Uh, and, you know, I mean, consider Ben Franklin and the Tea Party, all the stuff that went on. He was in London when the Tea Party happened and had to answer for that. Vaccines, the spread of viruses, and some people are even claiming that this solar eclipse thing can be predicted. So <laughs> you, might, you might want to do on that one. I uh, found a Facebook post from a friend of mine uh, a couple of days ago. She'd been at a funeral and was complaining on her private Facebook page, that the minister had spoken for about five minutes about the friend that had died. Read the obituary, did a couple of minutes on the person, and then went into an hour-long fire and brimstone sermon. The thing that bothers me about that is that's pretty much saying, well, we believe Susie here is already damned to hell. Let's try to save the rest of you. And it bothered me. It reminded me of going to a, a funeral for a, uh, a man that was a known philanderer. Everybody that knew him knew this. He, in fact, he lost a job over it. Uh, and, and it was knowledge all around his company. It was knowledge to everyone in his family. And yet everybody that walked up during the funeral talked about how great a guy he was and that as soon as he crossed that river, his first wife and his daughter met him there. Well, they had died before him. Uh, and 
I ended up at a funeral for a fellow hiker. Uh, it was not really a funeral, it was a memorial service. His ashes were there, little bitty vials of his ashes were there, and they were passed, anyone that wanted them could take some. Uh, the, the last act in this memorial service was people gathering in an ante room of where the uh, memorial service had been held and taking a shot of uh, his favorite alcohol. I wish I hadn't done that. My throat burned for a good long while and they didn't have any chasers. But it was interesting, and, and I had been told, don't come prepared for religion. Uh, he was not religious, we're not going to do this. And about 30 minutes into it, one of his nephews got up. And the first thing out of his mouth was, I know some people are not going to like this, but it's been heavy on my heart. And you knew at that point what was going to happen. In fact, as he started his sermon, his children, his Pre-adolescent children started passing out Bibles to the people in the memorial service. Uh, two rows behind me, some guy yelled, bullshit. <laughs> some, a couple rows behind me on the other side, someone yelled, bullshit. And then finally someone, a third person yelled, that's just your agenda. He wouldn't have wanted this. And the lady I'd gone to the memorial service with elbows me and says, you need to get up and say something. And wasn't my party. I wasn't the guest of honor, but I thought, well, I've got something I can say about him. So I stood up and walked down to the second row of, of pews and sat down there. They had invited anybody that wanted to talk to talk. And so this guy at least knew somebody was waiting on him, and it also gave somebody else in the, in the, in the congregation, in the uh, memorial service, to say, you have someone waiting for the lectern. And so he eventually wrapped up and left. But Again, he pretty much said, my uncle is done for, let's save the rest of you. So, so I got up, told everyone there, I got no clue what this guy's religion was if he had one. I don't know what, what he believed in politically, except that he was in favor of conserving the, uh, the areas where we hiked. I knew that, and he was big on that. But it's just not something you don't, all, you don't often in the middle of a nine mile hike, discuss religion. You don't often discuss uh, your politics. Mainly you're trying to stay breathing while, <laughs> while everybody else is breathing. Uh, but after it was over, I had several of his family members come up and thank me. Thank you for saying something funny about him after we just listened to the fact that he was condemned to hell. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, I didn't believe that anyway. but. You got to be careful, and and my point in all this is you don't have to wear a T-shirt that says I'm secular, I'm atheist, I'm agnostic, I'm satanic. You don't have to wear a T-shirt saying that, but from time to time you may need to, you may need to stand up and enforce your beliefs, <clears throat> even if it's that, even if that belief is we shouldn't condemn people to places we don't know for sure about. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Byron. Wonderful job, both of you. Of course, uh, as Byron mentioned, these uh, little speaking gigs are available to you. You can sign up, uh, just give us a shout, and give the free thought of the day. If you've got a quote you'd like to share or your own thought you'd like to share, you can uh, tell an interesting story from your life like Byrne just did. Or you can you know, do a skeptical sidebar and uh, pick out something that's just not scientifically accurate that's floating around out there. Um, our next speaker is the main event. We have Dr. Scott Austin, astrophysicist at Astro, yeah, astrophysicist at the University of Central Arkansas, who is going to uh, inform us about either the eclipse or the pending end of the world. You know, what, <laughs> depending on your worldview, it's going to be one or the other of those. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Scott Austin. You hear me okay back there? Okay. Uh, thanks for having me. So I'm going to kind of go over the nuts and bolts of eclipses and some of the things to expect for this particular eclipse and some of the events that we've got going on 
at uh, UCA that day. So a total solar eclipse is what we're looking at for uh, April 8th. So what needs to happen for a, solar, a total solar eclipse to happen? Uh, first of all, you need the shadow of the moon to land on the Earth. So the orientation has to be sun, moon, Earth. Uh, that means the phase of the moon has to be new moon, okay? And if you've got that alignment, then that's going to happen. The part of the shadow labeled umbra there, uh, that's where you're going to have totality. Uh, in the part that's labeled penumbra, uh, you'll be witnessing a partial solar eclipse in, in those areas. So we have new moon once a month. So this should happen every month, right? Well, no, because that being new phase is just part of the story. You don't always get that perfect alignment at new phase. The orbit of the moon is tilted by about five degrees. So there's only two spots in that moon's orbit where the moon is going to be in the same plane as the earth and the sun. Okay, those, those two points are called nodes. And if the moon isn't at one of those nodes, it's not going to be in the same plane, and that shadow is going to miss the Earth. That's the same reason we don't have lunar eclipses every month either. So the lunar eclipse is when the Earth's shadow hits the moon. But because of that tilt, most of the time, either new phase or full moon, that sh those shadows are going to miss each other. Okay. So A, you need new phase. B, the moon has to be at new phase during... Uh, has to be at one of those nodes during the new phase. And that still might not do it because the orbits of both the sun, excuse me, the orbits of both the earth around the sun and the moon around the earth aren't perfectly circular. They're elliptical, which means sometimes uh, the earth is a little bit closer to the sun and sometimes the Earth is a little bit further away, and that's going to dictate what the angular size of the Sun is. And the angular size of the Moon is also going to be dictated by how far away it is from us. They're both typically somewhere around close to half a degree wide on the sky. But depending on the combination, sometimes the Moon's angular size isn't going to be big enough to cover up the entire Sun, so you're still not going to have totality. Now, how many people have heard on the news when we're having a super moon? The news makes a big deal out of this. Well, uh, super moon, they're talking about that part when the moon is closest to the Earth so that its angular size is, is uh, at its maximum. Now, that's going to happen every month. They make a big deal of it when the moon is full and it's at the closest approach and then its angular size is a little bit bigger. If you go outside and look at the moon, you're not going to be able to tell. Uh, it's, it's a relatively small thing. And the thing that they don't talk about every year is when we have the super sun, right? No one talks about the super sun. Well, there's a super sun once a, once a year, and there's a mini sun once a year. And there's super moons and mini moons, right? So this, this diagram here is showing you that variation in the apparent angular size of those two things, of the sun and the moon. So in order to have totality, the moon's, again, the moon's angular size has to be bigger than the angular size uh, of the sun. If it's not, then you may have what we call an annular eclipse, where the moon's in front of the sun, uh, but you're still seeing part of the disk or the photosphere of the sun, so you get that ring effect. So if you remember back in October, we had an annular uh, solar eclipse go across the United States at that time. And we had a partial uh, at our location during that time. So that uh, shadow, uh, you can see it's not going to be terribly big when it intercepts the Earth. Uh, it's, it's about 120 miles wide, roughly. Uh, and it's going to be moving at a high rate of speed. It's going to be over 1,000 miles per hour. So that's also going to limit who can see the totality, because it's a re relatively small shadow, and for how long you're going to be able to see it, because it's moving right along, uh, because of the motions of the moon 
and uh, around the Earth. So this particular uh, solar eclipse uh, is part of a cycle of eclipses. There's something called the Saros -like cycle. Uh, there's usually some sort of solar eclipse about once every roughly 18 months or so. They're not always total. But there's these other cycles that uh, you can notice about uh, the solar eclipses. And the one coming up in April is part of something called the Saros Cycle 139. Uh, it's when the moon is going through that node from basically south to north is the particular node that it's, it's going to be doing. Uh, and the first one of this cycle dates back to about 1843. Uh, so there's been several of these sorrow cycles. So the 2017 total eclipse is part of a different sorrow cycle than this one. Of course, where the particular eclipse in a particular cycle is going to hit the Earth, that's going to change. These are all Saros 139s. And you can see they're going to hit different parts of the Earth at, at different times. So uh, our April 8th eclipse, uh, that's the path. I, I like this uh, particular path map. Uh, and if you were in Arkansas in 2017 for the eclipse at that time, you weren't saying, oh my God, right? We were partial. There's a huge difference between 99 and 100%. Uh, in, to, in terms of totality, how dramatic it looks. Yeah, there's no comparison between 99 and 100%. Uh, so uh, that's why people want to travel to get into the path. It's a dramatic sight to see this black hole in the sky where the sun is and be able to see the corona uh, around the sun. So uh, that's going to be people's motivation for that. Now. Typically, if you want to see a total solar eclipse during your lifetime, typically you're going to have to travel somewhere, okay? Because if you wait around for it, you may have to wait on average about 375 years, so more than a human lifetime. So if you really want, so the odds of any spot on the Earth getting a total solar eclipse once every 375 years, but it's worse than that because it might be cloudy that day, right? Mm -hmm. So your odds are even less than that, if you think about it. Uh, this is showing some of the total eclipse path, paths uh, for North America between 1901 and 1950. You'll see the last time a total solar eclipse passed over Arkansas was back in 1918. And from the reports that I've been able to dig up, it sounds like it was kind of cloudy that day. So it wasn't the best uh, time at that time either uh, because of the weather. Uh, so, of course, we had the 2017 that cut across the United States. Uh, the duration of the eclipse at that time isn't going to be as long as this one. This is going to be a longer duration eclipse. Uh, and you can see the next one that's going to pass over Arkansas isn't until 2045. So if you can last till 2045, you might be able to get another shot without traveling. So again, uh, there's just the eclipse path, and this is starting to show some of the population centers that it's going to go over and near. Uh, of course, it's going to cut across Arkansas. The blue line there is the center line. That's the sweet spot where you're going to have the longest duration of eclipse times. Okay? If you're more on the edges, you're not going to get as long a time. Okay? For where I'm going to be in Conway, we're going to be just under four minutes. We're going to be like uh, three minutes, uh, 56 seconds or something like that. If you're on that center line, you can get uh, over four minutes. Uh, so places like Atkins, Clinton, uh, some of those areas are going to have longer. Uh, so, uh, so for here in Little Rock, uh, you're going to be like two and a half minutes. Uh, if you view the eclipse from here. So you get totality here, but it's not going to be as long as it is if you're on the center line. And this is showing you some of the, some of the uh, totality times there as it passes over. So in terms of the numbers here, in terms of when and how long, uh, this is what you're looking at for Little Rock. Uh, so partial phase will start around a little after 1230. You'll have totality starting almost at 152. 
uh, mid eclipse almost 153, and in totality ending right, right around 154. So you're going to have you know, yeah about two and a half minutes of totality, and then you come out of totality, uh, you'll have partial phase uh, up till about uh, 313. Although once you're past totality, people aren't as interested, right? <laughs> There's all the anticipation leading up to totality. Uh, so uh, for Conway, like I said, we're closer to the center line. We're going to be a bit longer. We're still going to be sub four minutes. Uh, times are similar uh, for us in terms of when those things are going to be happening. Uh, but again, we get the bonus of, of being uh, nearly uh, four minutes. As I've alluded to, the wild, one of the wild cards in all of this is the weather. Okay, it's April. We could have a tornado warning that day, right? It's, you don't know. So looking at the, the weather data, this is indicating, if you look at Arkansas there and the, the legend on the right, you're looking at about a 50-50 chance. Uh, the good thing lately is we've been kind of in a dry weather pattern. If that holds, that might bode well for us. We'll, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, spring, April, you can see your odds get better. If you're super serious, you're heading to Mexico or even out in the Pacific Ocean, perhaps. Uh, and you can see as you head towards the northeast, your, your odds go down. But it's, again, that's, that's the wild card in all of this. Now, if it is cloudy, it will get darker than what it is during totality without the clouds. Without clouds, it's still going to be kind of a twilight sort of setting. Uh, but if it's cloudy, and if it's mostly cloudy, we're socked in with clouds, it's going to be like the middle of the night. And it's going to be like the middle of the night for longer than four minutes. Okay? Uh, you start getting into partial phase, it's really going to start to get dark quicker uh, if we're looking at clouds. Uh, the other thing that's got kind of a wild card and also hard to predict is what people are going to do in terms of wanting to come and see the eclipse in the eclipse path. Uh, this is the populations that are already in the eclipse path without anybody traveling. Okay, If you look at the population centers this is hitting, those are the sort of numbers that are already in the eclipse path. Of course, you're going to have people that are going to want to get into that eclipse path and depending on how they're going to do it, if they're going to drive, those are the quickest arteries to get you to the eclipse path, depending on where you're at. Okay, And so if you zoom in on that and you look at just Arkansas, what, what sort of interstates and highways filter feed into Arkansas, uh, that kind of tells you where people are coming on the road, where, where they might be coming from. So again, if, you, if you're up in Washington State and you're coming by car, uh, we're, we're the quickest spot that you can get to, uh, to be in that path. So predicting how many people we're going to have here is going to be hard. Even if, you know, we get to a week out, we're going to know what the weather is likely to be. Okay. And if the weather forecast is good, expect higher numbers. But even if it's clear, it's going to be hard to predict exactly how many people we're going to have. Of course, you're going to have a lot of people doing the last minute thing. Okay, They're going to be like a day before, the weather looks good, let's hop in the car tomorrow and go. You're going to have a lot of that happening too. Uh, so it's, it's going to be hard to pr predict exactly uh, what, how many people we're going to have. So in terms of what you're going to see, you're going to see something like this in terms of the sequence. Uh, so you'll have partial where the moon is starting to cover. Uh, the sun, uh, when you're, if it's not partial, if you see the entire sun, or if it's partial and you want to look directly, you're going to need some sort of filtering. You're going to need eclipse glasses. If you're using binoculars or a telescope, you're going to need uh, the right kind of filters on the front end of your telescope or binoculars or your camera uh, if you're trying to take pictures. You get to totality, then you don't need filtering. In fact, filtering isn't going to help you during totality because what you're really going to want to see is that corona that you see sticking out there. And your eyes are actually going to be more sensitive detectors to that corona than your camera is. Okay? Your eye has a huge dynamic range compared to your eyes, so you're going to be able to see that corona uh, better. Uh, in terms of filters, uh, 
buyer beware. Uh, I would recommend only purchasing Eclipse glasses from vendors that are listed at the American Astronomical Society website. Uh, if you think back to, if you're familiar what happened back in 2017, there are a lot of bogus glasses sold. Okay, even UCA experienced that. They they thought they'd done their due diligence and they still got a bad batch. Okay, so you, you got to be careful. And again, uh, if you're using binoculars, cameras, telescopes, those have to go on the front end. You cannot be using the eclipse glasses and a telescope. Because you'll burn, you'll literally burn through that mylar in a fraction of a second with with the telescope. The telescope is concentrating the light, so you gotta you gotta stop it before it even gets into uh, the telescope. Other things to expect during totality is again, it will get dark enough. It won't be like the middle of the night, but it will get dark enough that you'll be able to see the brighter stars in the sky and the planets that are in the sky, and there may actually even be a comet that, if it's active enough, will be visible. If you've heard anything about 12P Pons Brooks, that comet, uh, that will be kind of between Jupiter and the Sun in terms of where it's going to be located. So if, if we've got good weather uh, and that's active enough that you, you might be able to see that. But there's going to be, a lot of the planets are kind of scrunched in on the sky near the Sun right now. So. Uh, Venus, Mercury, Saturn, Mars, Jupiter will all be up. A lot of these bright uh, winter stars will be up and you'll have basically the summer triangle of stars uh, up as well at that time. And again, uh, the corona will be visible. Uh, if the sun is active, you might be able to see some of these prominences around the limb of the moon there. Uh, the sun's been fairly active lately uh, and in fact, uh, before totality, when we're impartial, there may be some interesting sunspots going on uh, on the sun. And I'll, sh I'll show you some examples from a couple, three weeks ago. Uh, the studying that corona, that outer atmosphere, used to be you had to do that during uh, total solar eclipses. Uh, we have technology now with certain special space telescopes where you don't have to do that. But there's still people that are going to travel and to study the solar corona uh, at that time. And Einstein became famous because of a total solar eclipse. So when he published his general relativity, uh, which is a framework of how gravity works, where gravity bends space and time, uh, the prediction of that is if you've got a big, massive body that ought to distort the space and distort the path of light to you from other stars. And so the background stars to the sun ought to be able to, ought to be seen to change position. And so one of the first solar eclipses after the publication of that work, there were expeditions that went out to make that measurement. So you know exactly where those stars ought to be if the sun's not there and if they're not in those positions, you know the sun is, is quote, bending space and time. And that, that's what they saw. They were able to see those shifts in those positions of those stars. And that was one of the first tests of uh, general relativity. There's been lots of other tests at this point, uh, but that's a classic test. If you're familiar with something called gravitational lensing, that's this, okay? Now you may hear about it in terms of black holes and things like that, but any, any sort of body is going to warp the space around it and, and cause the path of the light to change. So, other things to expect during the eclipse, the temperature will come down, you're blocking that sunlight, the temperature is going to come down, you may notice the insects, the birds, the animals are going to think it's time to roost. So. Be aware of your surroundings, of what, what's all happening uh, during, uh, during the eclipse. Uh, some of the things that uh, we've got on tap in Conway and at UCA. Uh, currently, uh, I'm running an eclipse show uh, in the planetarium. Uh, so I've been running that since the beginning of the month. I'm going to be doing that throughout the month at the regular uh, planetarium show times, which are Fridays and Saturday nights at 7 o'clock. 
The weekend of the eclipse, I'm going to be doing a lot more of those. So on Saturday and Sunday, uh, 6th and 7th, I'll be doing four of those shows uh, a day. So, uh, so if you don't catch uh, the next one, the next couple there, uh, you can come to those on the weekend of. And then, uh, and then if you, if anytime you want to see what the schedule is of what I'm doing in the planetarium, you can go to the website listed there. If you just search UCA Planetarium, you, Google will get you there. Uh, other things that we've got on tap, uh, so we've got a committee on campus that have been organizing events, events leading up to and that weekend and the day of. Okay, so if you go to uca.edu slash eclipse, you can see, go to events and it'll show you everything we've got going on uh, in the days leading up to uh, the eclipse. We got everything from some seminars on how to take images. Uh, we've got uh, orchestra, special orchestra events that are astronomy themed. Uh, we've got some special movies that are being shown in addition to the planetarium shows that I'm doing. And then the day of, we basically are going to have a watch party on campus. Uh, we're going to have a couple of areas on campus where people can come out. One main area is going to be basically the football stadium area so people can be in the stands or on the field. Uh, there's another area on campus where they're going to be having something called the Barcanalia. Uh, which is more of an artsy type thing. They're going to have this inflatable statue. Uh, you can bring your dogs. They're going to have craft events and, and things of like, like that. Uh, in the stadium, we're going to have stuff for kids to do. Uh, we're going to, a lot of it's uh, science-based, but not all of it. Uh, so there's going to be some STEM-type activities going on uh, there as well. There's going to be food vendors. There's going to be some other stuff there. Again, if you want more details, you can go there and you can see everything that, that's going on. Uh, what, I, what I'm going to be doing, if it's clear, is I'm going to be up in the observatory live streaming the eclipse. So uh, I got a grant for a camera, a lens, a filter. Uh, so I've got, I'm going to have that on piggyback on the telescope. And then I've got a computer that I purchased as well. Uh, with enough horsepower from a graphics card standpoint that I can 4K stream to YouTube. Uh, so if you go on YouTube, do search on UCA Physics and Astronomy, uh, you can get there. You can get there from the link down below there as well. So what's up there now is a couple of test streams that I did. I've got a test stream of the moon there, test stream of the sun that I've done. Uh, and like I said, uh, the sun's been active. Uh, that's not an artifact, that's an actual sunspot group on the sun there that you're seeing on the left. Uh, on the right, we've got an image of the moon and the same sort of magnification there, you, so you can see the relative sizes. Uh, and that's the telescope. Uh, the mount is, uh, is new as well. Uh, I'm not, the live stream isn't through the telescope, it's that camera and lens that you see piggyback on the telescope there. Uh, is going to be what I'm going to be using. So hopefully it's going to be clear, uh, and uh, that that'll be able to happen. So that's that's what I'm using in terms of camera, uh, the Sony Alpha 6400, uh, the lens that I'm using, the solar filter I'm I'm going to be using. There's going to be some fumbling around that I'm going to have to do once we're in totality, because I'm going to have to take that filter off. <laughs> I'm going to have to screw that filter off and then readjust and. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of fumbling around with, with that. But uh, so I'll end with this list of links. There's lots of info out there. If you go to American Astronomical Society, uh, they've got lots of information there on eclipses, how to safely view eclipses. Uh, NASA has their eclipse site. Uh, there are other eclipse sites like Eclipse 2024. 20, uh, uh, there's the UCA eclipse site. Uh, Conway has their uh, eclipse page. Uh, we've got, again, the observatory. Uh, if you also want to see other events that I'm doing at the observatory, I do public uh, viewing there. I try to do once a month. Uh, so if you want to come to one of those, you can as well. But there's kind of an overview. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll take questions. Yeah, I can give you the microphone time for questions. 
Can you say your name like the school? The eclipses always happen in the middle of the day. I mean, could you have an eclipse at five in the afternoon? Oh yeah, yeah, you can have eclipses at sunset. I've never actually been under a total solar eclipse. I've been to an annular back in like 1992, I believe. Uh, I was in San Diego, and it was an annular eclipse that was happening at sunset. So it's not necessarily at noon. Okay. Yep. One. Uh, back in was 2017, they had the eclipse. I went up to Missouri. And that was a total, I believe. Yeah, that was a total. The eclipse time wasn't wasn't as long as what this is going to be, but yeah. Right. That is spectacular. In fact, we had arranged, the, when we were driving up to their a place to view it from, which is right in the path of totality. And when we got out, the highways were just horrible. Everybody and his brother. So we turned off and we got to a place where they had a little open spot by a store and saw the eclipse. So now, it turns out my son uh, has a farm in Pottsville. And so we're going to go up on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Stay overnight. Yeah, that's the way to do it. <laughs> enjoy it. So, uh, Wait for the traffic to clear out. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. We just have to clear out afterwards. But it was, it's a site that is incredible site. Yeah. I recommend anybody to find a place that you can Yeah, if you go if you go if you've not seen totality, you can go on YouTube and 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 watch some videos of people that are watching uh, a total eclipse and people are losing their minds. They're hooting and hollering and yelling and screaming and so it's and it gets cold too. Yeah, the temperature is going to come down. There's also interviews that you can see of people right after the eclipse, and they're emotional. For some people, this is a hugely emotional thing to witness. Not as much a question, but a, a <laughs> comment. There's an application available for your cell phone called Solar Eclipse Timer. It costs like $2, and they actually call out loud, now it's time to take, put your glasses, take your glasses off, and now it's time to look for the diamond ring of the, of the corona, so. That might be useful to me. Because I'm going to need to know, okay, now I need to take the filter off, uh, it's got almost over, I need to put right. it back on. It points out a number of other interesting science things that have to do with the way the shadows behave, and yeah. so it's probably worth $2 if, if you're so inclined. And you'll be able to see that shadow coming at you from, from the horizon. Yeah. Could you put the slide up again about when you dig your planetarium shadows? And just let me take a photo of that. Yep, yep. I think I can remember it. And this, this will be on, they're, they're going to put this up on YouTube this, if, so you can always find it. But, but that's, this is the eclipse thing. The, there, there's my planetarium thing. But yeah, if you just do UCA planetarium, uh, you'll be able to find that. Will this uh, slideshow be up on uh, when Bruce can download it? I, I don't, and I don't know if I've got <laughs> exclusive rights to all the graphics, but... Well, you can go to the uh, ASF YouTube channel. But it, it'll be up there. Find it there. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a couple days. <laughs> yep. I understand that the uh, Fletcher Library, they have a solar telescope, and they also said that they are going to be playing uh, the sound of the eclipse. And so I, I wanted to know if you knew what, what the, that meant. I don't know what that means right offhand. Uh, now, one of my colleagues got a grant for a small radio telescope, and he's going to have it out on the football field that day and point it at the sun so that, he can, so that we can see the change in radio signal uh, from the sun. That would be the only thing that I can think of is radio, but it, they could be doing other things as well. You know, who knows? <laughs> How long has... <clears throat> Not, not just scientists, but how long has the general public 
really understood what was happening during the eclipse. Uh, there, there's a story about uh, from Mark Twain about uh, an eclipse, and he fooled people. A guy went back in time and fooled people because he was able to predict the eclipse. How long did people in general really know what was going on? Well, it kind of depends on what you mean by knowing what's going on. Uh, so Babylonians, Mayan, Aztecs, they were observing the sky and eclipses over long enough periods of time that they noticed cycles. And so from that standpoint, once they saw the cycles, they could make predictions, right? They're making predictions, but did they actually know what was going on? You know, that's, that's the other thing. So knowing what's going on is a, is a more recent sort of thing in terms of no, realizing, yeah, that's the moon <laughs> that's blocking the sun and not, not some gra a dragon or snake that's eating the sun. Something interesting that I read across one time is the king of Siam, his name is Mangak, who was one the famous one of the musicals about went down, they were having a total eclipse down in the southern part of uh, Thailand. And he went down to watch it. You see, he was, a, he was a very educated man. He was doing calculations and so he knew what it was going to come about. And he got bitten by a mosquito and got malaria and died. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's a lot of history that I don't know in terms of, of, of eclipses like that. I just kind of know anecdotally some things in terms of if you're if you're a king and your your astrologers didn't predict that solar eclipse, those astrologers could lose their heads, you know that because yeah, and and there are certain cultures where solar eclipses and that was Chris alluded to that earlier. They were bad omens, right? So. And if you didn't, if your astrologers didn't predict that bad omen, you don't have good astrologers, right? <laughs> but I guess you mentioned um, that the closer you are to the center line, the longer totality will be. And here in the Little Rock, uh, we're kind of on the southern edge. Right. I'm just trying to figure: is it going to be worth it? Are we going to have like light leaking in from the south a little bit, or is it not going to be as dark as if we go to the center line? Is it worth the drive for the country to be I think. In terms of darkness, it'll be about like we are in Conway. It's more of just a, a more of a the interval is going to be less. You're, you, we're going to have the, you if you're in Little Rock in Conway, you're still going to have that sort of twilight, 360 degrees on the horizon. Uh, it's it's going to be about the same from that standpoint. It's just a duration thing. I suppose if you were right right on that very edge. That might become more of an issue, but because you could be standing where you get seconds of totality, right? Plus, in 2017, when we were in Nebraska, you also had to deal with the lights that come on automatically because it's getting dark, yeah. and so you you had what we call uh, light noise. Yeah, light pollution. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't set up camp right under a street light. <laughs> Did you know any, how many people hurt their eyes back in October when there was that eclipse? I don't have any information on that, but uh, but the other thing you can do, you can go online and there's optometrists and ophthalmologists that can that have pictures up of where there's permanent burns shaped as the crescent sun on people's retinas. So, so yeah, there's, there's, so you, sun causes sunburns, right? So you, you sunburn your retina. All right, well, if there's no more questions, uh, let's give Scott Austin a big round of applause. <laughs> So we've got some upcoming events I want to tell you about. On Monday, we've got Pint Night uh, at the Flying Saucer, is that correct? Uh, opportunity to get out and socialize with some friends. Um, on the following Monday, the 25th, next week, we've got a Zoom night, followed by uh, our board meeting. We're moving it to the 26th, to, you know, spring break and all. 
And on uh, Tuesday, April 2nd, uh, we'll have our first Tuesday get together at um, American Pie Pizza in North Little Rock. So there's all sorts of options, all sorts of opportunities to get out there and uh, you know break away from the iPad, break away from <laughs> your internet arguments and important things like that to uh, come out and see your friends. Second Sunday? Yes, and then um, every second Sunday of the month there is a meetup at um, Cantina Cinco de Mayo out on, what is that road out there? Stagecoach, yes, thank you. And so all this is available on the arfreethinkers.org website um, or our meetup.com page. Just go to meetup.com, look for Arkansas Society of Freethinkers. Our calendar's posted there. You can put the app on your phone. You can sync the calendar to your Google Calendar or Apple Calendar, whatever. Uh, lots of ways to keep up with what's going on and, and be in the know. So, um, and while you're on the arfreethinkers.org website, I invite you to please uh, join our organization and support us. We, uh, you know, have a lot of expenses to keep websites and, uh, you know, post office boxes and everything else up and running, and we could use your support. Um, also, if you want to support, the more fun way is to host an event, something that you're interested in or passionate about. We need people who are interested in hosting uh, potlucks, book clubs, family meetups, uh, whatever you can think of that you like. There, chances are that there's somebody out there in our orbit that uh, would join you in that. So feel free to uh, reach out to any of us if you'd like to have something posted on Meetup for your own event. And with that said, I appreciate everybody making it out today. And it's uh, overcast today, but hopefully on April 8th, it will not look like today's weather. It will be nice and clear. There, there, there will be tears either way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> tears either way. Probably fewer people burning their eyes out if it's cloudy, though. So, uh, tears of joy or tears of sadness. And I never did quite establish, d does this mean the end of the world? <laughs> it's happening. Okay. If the world ends, then our subsequent meetings will be canceled after the eighth. So just, but if it doesn't end, it's, it's full go. Thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, check us out online at arfreethinkers.org. You can also find us on Meetup. Facebook, and on YouTube. At Arkansas Society of Freethinkers, people are accepted as human beings and are never threatened with eternal damnation. In a nutshell, a freethinker believes there are no imaginary gods whose dogma is sent to control the human race. Rather, we are all human beings responsible for our own actions and our own future. Check us out at any of the following online locations. Send us an email and let's talk. Or Go to Meetup and join us at any of our regularly scheduled events. Let's get together and hope to see you soon.